<laughs> so thank you all for coming to the Yacht Seminar series and today we're going to have Peter Rowley Connolly who's going to talk to us about Casa Ibrahim and pre-Islamic agriculture. So thank you. Welcome. Uh, well thank you, thank you Tamas. Thank you everyone for coming out on a um, very dark uh, and inhospitable Wednesday evening. I've raised these three people here. Um, a few days ago, I really thought I wasn't going to make it because I'd lost my voice and was able oh. barely even to whisper. Uh, the bad news for you all, I'm afraid, is that I went back. So, so here I am with most of my voice. Okay, I'm going to talk about Casa Abreu and a very long-term change in the agricultural record. Um, underneath that anomalous security password device up there is the name of my co-author Alan Clapham uh, who <laughs> is a vital part of this. Uh, basically we were the two successive uh, botanist samplers at Casa from uh, 1982 through to about 2003 or 4 or something like that. Uh, he then became a postdoc uh, and did all the hard work on the IDs and so forth I could explain to everyone that we're ready to write the book. We've been ready to write the book for three or four years, and we've got everything, we've got a chapter plan sorted out, we know exactly who's going to do what. We just haven't quite written the book, but, but we will be very, very soon. Anyway, um, in days of yore, when I was a postgrad, I used to look for plant remains in really very inhospitable sorts of places. This is in northern Jutland. I was using salt water from the sea to run the seed machine on. Sometimes the sea would be frozen. I would have to break the ice to get a bucket full of water. Uh, but I learned the error of my ways. And Nubia is altogether a different story. Uh, the trouble with Nubia is that once you do any sort of work there, you're more or less ruined for all other subsequent work because nothing ever really lives up to uh, Nubia. Nubia, southern Egypt. Uh, here's a map showing all the big tourist sites from the pyramids down to Aswan. Casa Ibrahim right down in the south. The excavation took place as part of the British contribution towards rescuing the archaeology when the Aswan High Dam was built. Uh, you see the problem here, if I go back to the title slide, the site is actually still above the water. Somebody in about 1960 got their levels wrong on a theorolite and most of the site remains above water. So the British effort uh, rather falls flat, uh, especially when you compare it to moving uh, Abu Simbel and all the rest of it. But okay, this is where we are. Uh, when David Roberts went to Casa de Brim in 1832, this is looking south. Casa de Brim's on the left. Uh, fortunately, it's not a thing. There it is, on its clifftop crag. Uh, looming a couple of hundred feet over the Nile Valley with the whole Nubian civilization down below it. There is as near to the same vantage point as I can get uh, in the recent past with the huge Lake Lake NASA filling up, um, filling up with sediment now by all counts as well as water. But that is basically what's left. The entire civilization of Nubia uh, underneath the waters. Here's a long telephoto view of Casa de Brim. That's the Coptic Cathedral that you can see there, the main building, from the top of the first mountains. Uh, the lake there is three or four miles wide, and you're looking out into the Sahara, uh, and about 3,000 miles away in that direction is the Atlantic, and that's about all there is to see. Uh, what's here is the old pilgrim road uh, running across the desert uh, into Casa de Brim, but take out the water and put back this flourishing valley agriculture in the bottom where the lake now is and you have a picture of Nubia as it ought to be. I'll just show you a couple of slides to kind of acclimatise you to what the archaeology is like. Um, <clears throat> that's what we live on or lived on. <laughs> uh, a luxury houseboat I'm told when it was built in about 1928. Uh, by the time we got it it was overrun with rats, the engine didn't work, the water system didn't work, nothing basically worked. Uh, what we had to do was, uh, behind it, to the rear there, is the antiquity service tugboat from Aswan. And that would trundle us down the lake, uh, abandon us at Catherine Bream, and look in sort of every week or two to see if we were still alive. 
And uh, really, it was, uh, I mean, in, in, especially in the 80s, it was very, very cut off indeed. Uh, the most memorable time was when we had two houseboats uh, and uh, we were just setting off from Aswan when this blue ship turned up and it was carrying a cargo of cement down to the Sudan. So we bribed the captain, shackled all these vessels together and proceeded this sort of raft-like formation down the lake at about five miles an hour. It takes about three days and it's absolutely glorious because there's nothing to do except sit in the sun and uh, just get ready to start work when you get there. Anyway, so, so it, it's, it's a bit of a one-off when it comes to actually working there. Uh, it's an awful lot more of a one-off when you get into the archaeology, as I will show you. The first occupation may well be back in the New Kingdom. There are some individual finds of New Kingdom age, although there are new, no New Kingdom deposits uh, as yet at least found on the site. The earliest major occupation seems to be around 1000 to 800 BC. Uh, I managed to get a radiocarbon date off a wall, which is a rare thing to do. Uh, a mud brick wall tempered with barley straw. To give you a taste of things to come, that is nearly 3,000 year old barley straw crushed out of a mud brick and sent off for AMS dating. It really looks pretty good, doesn't it? Right, so there is a bewildering agglomeration and overlay and composite uh, mess of walls and structures and all the rest of it. Uh, the seasons I was there, they had a full-time, well, he was called a temple architect, whose job it was to disentangle the seasons. This was um, partly uh, allowed to decay for the last 150 years before excavation, and partly dug really rather badly in its first few seasons, and then taken over by uh, more competent archaeologists a little bit later in its history. So what we're seeing there is partly the result of poor excavation, and then we have to kind of unentangle uh, all the um, different structures and layers and all the rest of it. Uh, this wall, nicknamed Gold Number One, uh, it remains the oldest thing, and as I say there, it's about 1000 to 800 BC when you calibrate the radio carbon dates. Camels. Um, the oldest trace of camel, I don't know whether it's been beaten or not yet, but uh, I was right down in the sort of deepest layers of the sondage and out came some camel dung, very well preserved as you can see, uh, ready to come dated to the first quarter of the first millennium BC. Uh, and I came up with a wonderful theory about how Casa de Bream was first occupied at the time of camels because if you cut off the kind of huge subcontinental sized S bend of the Nile and go straight north, which you might achieve on a camel, Casa de Bream is a very good place to cross the river. And there are these great big cairns in the desert on both sides, which uh, I hypothesized were kind of markers for the camel caravans. Uh, I was told not to be so idiotic, and if I really was going to make this argument, I should go and buy some camels in Khartoum and see if I can do the trip myself. I have so far not, not actually acted on that suggestion. <laughs> Right, so here is the regular occupation, a series of uh, horizons of various kinds, uh, much of it now quite well established. So down at the bottom there, you can see that 1800 BC, old number one of the Caratum. Then a major occupation around 700 BC, the 25th dynasty, which is the Sudanese dynasty uh, that comes out of the south and rules Egypt for a couple of hundred years. Then that is apparently a bit of a gap and sometime, sort of 300, 200-ish BC, uh, Ptolemaic deposits arrive. And then, uh, I think the correct date for the Roman occupation is 23 BC. I think it's actually recorded. But the Roman archaeological period is about the first century AD. The Romans are then recorded as giving the place up. Uh, they really didn't think that the uh, Dodecasaurus, the 12 provinces down right in the south of New York, were worth the candle defending it, so they just gave them up <coughs> and walked away. The Maoris again, far from the south, moved in, took over till 1300 and collapsed. Uh, the so called X Horizon uh, is simply named after one style of pottery, and it appears to be local rulers kind of taking over. Uh, conversion building of the big Coptic cathedral that you've seen uh, around 550-600 AD and it moves through three big phases of medieval Christian occupation. Uh, the Ottomans take over in, I think the precise date is 1519, and it runs through until AD 1811. So there's a 
getting it was certainly continuous 2,000 years and getting on for uh, 3,000 years altogether. And altogether, the archaeology is spectacular because we're in an area where um, it's not low rainfall, it's no rainfall at all. Uh, it rain, it's rained in Aswan half a dozen times in the 20th century, that's all. So the archaeological uh, deposits are absolutely fantastic. Basketry just comes out of the ground looking as if it was buried yesterday. So a full-time basketry specialist is required on site. Absolutely stunning. Roof matting, that's, this is palm roof matting here. Uh, they tend to be used uh, for um, roofing, apparently. Then after they get a bit tatty and decayed, they go on the floor, and when they fall to bits, they line the bottom of pits. And in between the different bits of pit lining, you start to get botanical samples that I go after, uh, bits that trickle in between the different uh, linings of the pit. Cloth, about a quarter of a million items. Uh, cloth comes out in bewildering confusion. Quite often it's still coloured. Uh, that uh, ecat bit of silk there came out of a tomb, uh, of, of a medieval tomb. It was of a completely unknown design in Western, in the Western world. Uh, there were no parallels. The ecat weave is a very complicated weave. Uh, I'm given to understand that you take a thread of silk, tie knots in it at different places, and then dye the knotted silk. So the dye binds onto just the bits outside the knots. Then you undo the knots, put knots elsewhere, including the bit you've already dyed, dye the newly knotted version, and so you get one strip of silk with different colours along its length. You plan this very carefully in advance to get your pattern like this. Uh, since there were no parallels whatsoever, a bit of that was sent for Hermes dating at its first century AD. So, which means that it that must have come along all the way from China to end up in a medieval tomb at Casa de Brie. Quite startling, really. Yeah, yeah, all the comforts of home. Uh, leather slippers, that, those are tobacco leaves, there's a bronze uh, tobacco pipe there, there's a little, nice little reamer, little knife there, uh, all bound up, uh, and um, you know, the, the, the string that holds the bowl onto the stem, I didn't put that there, it was there when we found it, in a little niche in the wall, so somebody literally went away and left it. It really is quite uncanny doing archaeology like this. Lots and lots of little cloth bundles turn up, and you never quite know who's going to get the contents. This is a human fetus, sometimes they're plant remains, sometimes they're little bits of dust, probably rubbed off a monument uh, somewhere else as a kind of um, pilgrimage talisman and taken away home. Documents turn up in about 10 different languages. These are some of the most recent ones. Uh, they, they're dated, so uh, I thought I'd put them up. But there, there's, uh, you know, there, there is written script going back to the Meroitic. Uh, all kinds of bits and pieces come up. And then there are plot remains. Look at that. Uh, I arrived, um, it was John Alexander who met me in the tea room in Cambridge and said, why don't you come to Egypt and check our site over and see if there are any plot remains? I thought, right, I know how to do plot remains. So I've got all that experience of doing flotation on shelvings in Jutland. Um, we'll need a flotation machine. And John said, well, I don't know, we know the practicalities of that are going to be a little bit difficult getting it out there. Uh, and I came out, I went, I, 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 looking at the section like that, you are absolutely shell-shocked compared to, how do you sample this? I spent a long time sampling the middle of pit fills. Uh, I, well, I spent a couple of weeks until I realised that it was a mug scape. Of course, this is pit backfill, and although it's full of plant remains, that is not what was stored in the pit. You've got to go underneath the basket sections at the bottom to find the wheat or sorghum or beans or whatever it may be, uh, you know, a few dozen of those that have trickled into there uh, and got away from uh, the people who then entered the pit out. So I threw away all my um, windblown pit fill samples and began doing the real thing to try to write the history of agriculture. But it really was a considerable shock landing in basically perfect preservation. I'm going to mention three main agricultural phases. The late Pharaonic, which is mostly 25th dynasty, which is mostly 700 uh, BC, plus or minus a bit. Then the period of rapid change, 81 to 400, maybe starts 50 BC or thereabouts. 
And that's the phase that I want to call the Nubian Agricultural Revolution. And then, many were in recent, after AD 400, up to abandonment in, well, 1811 is when the records show that the site was abandoned. Okay, so the late pharaonic samples, phase one. Uh, the Nile flood. Here is somebody's tomb from the Valley of the Nobles. I forget exactly whose it is, but the nobles are basically much more interesting if you're a kind of archaeobot sort of person, uh, because they show what was going on all day. Lots and lots of irrigation, canals, agriculture, and all the rest of it. So especially at the time this work was initially done, most of the history of Egyptian uh, cultivation, ancient Egyptian cultivation, was based on documentary evidence. Uh, interpreting wall paintings, all that sort of stuff. The situation is, or has been, considerably electrified, but there is still quite a long way to go. So I'll show you what was going through uh, in that time. Okay, traditionally, as I'm sure you know, uh, the Nile rises and falls on an annual basis. It rises gently, floods the areas where the water can reach, and then recedes, leaving very productive, fertile silt. So traditionally, you plant in the silt as the flood waters recede, and then harvest a little bit later on. I'll show you the kind of agricultural year cycle uh, fairly shortly. So this, this is the Nile by uh, Luxor, and you can see that um, how much of all this is due to irrigation, and how, well, nowadays, of course, it's all due to irrigation because the Nile doesn't flood because of the Aswan High Dam. But the Aswan High Dam produces the water, supposedly, which uh, allows cultivation. You can see the flat land, there's the river running there, and we've got what, a couple of miles of relatively low-lying, uh, flattish land, some of which would be flooded by the Nile flood, and that would give you the limits of cultivation. So with a high Nile flood, you cover quite a lot of land, get quite a big harvest. With low Nile floods, you get lower, uh, less silt on the land, and uh, smaller harvests. And uh, people argue about the correlation between the rise and fall of Egyptian dynasties and kingdoms uh, as against the rises and falls, long-term rises and falls of the Nile and agricultural productivity. I haven't really got time to go into that here. But okay, so Egypt may look like a great big rectangular block on the map, but actually it's a very, very thin ribbon of cultivation along the Nile, uh, which is the serious bit. And of course, Traditionally, we're all told, and I'm sure it's true, that in the season of the year, when it's too hot and dry for any cultivation, you put all these hundreds of thousands of peasants that can be fed in the Nile to work, to stop them going idle, and so you make them build pyramids or um, go and smite the Hittites or whatever it is you're going to do with them that particular year. Right, you can extend the flooding of the Nile. That, of course, gives you more land to cultivate, and the shadouf, basically the bucket on a weighted arm, is, in pharaonic times, the only way to do that. And you can see that, that it, it's a pretty laborious and cumbersome process, and it's not really going to extend things very far. Little tiny garden plots during the summer might be all you can manage, but down below, at the bottom there, there is the agricultural year, with the Nile flooding in July, and so the agricultural land is flooding through most of the rest of the year. By about December, it's starting to go down, so you start to plant in the silt that is revealed as the Nile recedes, plant, 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 and you harvest in April and May, and at that point, it becomes too hot and dry to do anything in the summer, uh, and then you have to watch the Nile flood the land again from July onwards. So one single season of agriculture in the year. <laughs> so what have we got at 700 BC? Uh, the main cereals are hulled barley and then a wheat. And most of the things I'm going to show you come from in between bits of basketry dropped into the bottom of pits and designed to seal the pit. But then items like this, a few double handfuls of wheat or uh, barley in this case, uh, go in between the bits of basketry, and when the basketry specialist lifts them up, I go, oh, look at that, and grab the stuff that's underneath. So uh, that's basically uh, the complexity of sampling uh, in preservation like this. <laughs> so the main cereals are the traditional winter cereals, it all fits rather well, hull barley and emma wheat. 
Oil plants, we've got various forms. Uh, linseed on the right there. Uh, the castor oil bean, there's an awful lot of those about. Uh, and also, so we, we, which I didn't recognize for a long time, I had to be told by our cook in the houseboat what they were. Uh, ben oil nuts, there are a lot of oil that is a tree, um, so that, that is not so uh, seasonally limited, but a variety of oil plants, all of them very well known from uh, other, uh, you know, slightly earlier, uh, full pharaonic uh, ancient Egyptian agriculture. Spices, coriander seeds, and onion seeds and indeed onions. So uh, the food here, I think a limited range of ingredients, but possibly quite interesting. So um, uh, you know, they're making an effort, I think, to um, spice up their relatively limited uh, set of foods. And the shape of things to come, there are various seeds of grass sorghum, wild sorghum, which I dare say is a weed of cultivation, or maybe it was collected for animal fodder or bedding or something of that sort. But this is distinctly wild, it is not yet cultivated sort of. Okay, going on from here, then around BC 50 or the year zero, I don't think it was a year zero, it must be 81, we start getting really abrupt and massive changes. Sorghum, domesticated sorghum, uh, there are a number of heads of domesticated sorghum. They come straight out of the ground. They are buried in the dry sand deposit. All I've done is pick them up, blow the dust off them, and photograph them. That's what they look like when they come out of the ground. On the right, you can see some seeds. Uh, the seeds, these, the, the, there's a five fold sorghum taxonomy uh, evolved by people like uh, Holland and uh, it's, and that's evolved by them on present day sorghum types and I've got two sorts of cattle breed. They fit they right into their taxonomy. So that's a very, very critical effort on their part. That stuff that is 2,000 years older than the material they use to design their taxonomy with uh, four fits right into it. So the grains are black. Uh, they're not free threshing. You have to grind them after you've uh, threshed the things to remove them from the heads. You have to then grind them again uh, to remove the husks. So there's a kind of quite distinct process of uh, well, processing. Cotton. The Romans acquired cotton from somewhere. And if anybody's going to ask them which species of cotton this is, I don't know, right? It's either arboreum or herbaceum, and I don't know which it is. Alan Tucker and I are still working to try to identify these things. 25 years ago, I thought I knew what it was. But it's actually, it actually turns out that the identification. So uh, I'm going to reserve judgment on that in a moment. These are the pods. We have plenty of kind of cotton lint, cotton wool, basically, some of it spun. So uh, definite agriculture using cotton coming in just before the birth of Christ. New wheat species. If there are any wheat buffs out there, there are some internodes. The seeds are very hard to uh, tell apart, but the internodes are relatively straightforward. And on the right there, you can see some late pharaonic emma, 25th dynasty. And on the left, there is bread wheat with the great big sort of shield shaped uh, individual internodes you can see there. Uh, and two new forms of wheat <coughs> coming at this time bread wheat and uh, the uh, tetraploid macaroni wheat or hard wheat, whatever you want to call it. So there's new wheats coming in as well. Oil plants. Sesame there at the bottom. And also the termis bean, Lupinus albus. Um, uh, 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 I'll play my own trumpet briefly. I think I may be the world champion archaeobotanical bean sample holder. That makes any sense at all. Uh, there was you know, one of these usual things. I was going along with our basketry specialist. I said, oh, there's a pit base come out over there. Uh, let's go see if there's anything in it. So she lifted up a few bits and pieces, and there was a handful of these beans underneath. I thought, oh, good, you know, another sample of beans. That's, that's tremendous. So just what we want. So I began sort of getting them out, and there were more, and there were more, and an awful lot more. And in the end, I realized that actually what we had removed was not the base of the pit, but the cap of this pit. Uh, there were four sackfuls of, I don't know how many beans that is, but it took four Egyptian laborers to carry these sacks of beans uh, down to the house. Where's four? I know they remain most of them. I don't know what to do with them. 
So, so um, I, they weigh an awful lot. So anyway, there we are. And once again, it was our uh, magnificent cook, Dasuki, who, when I first found these things, I'd gone to uh, Kew and I talked to various people and said, what am I going to find uh, in Egypt? And I'd looked at all the parts of the no one had suggested this. So it was our cook, Dasuki, who said, ah, oh, terrorist. You know, and uh, then when I got to Aswan on the way back, I bought some in the bar and had a check, and sure enough, uh, you, you buy them now, they're like crisps out there. And sure enough, that's exactly what they are. So, uh, oil plants coming in. After AD 400, the pace of change slows markedly. Uh, the most advanced race of cultivated sorghum, sorghum dura, uh, comes in, which is completely compact headed. And this is where things start to get difficult if you're relying on the documentary evidence. Because that compact yellow seed head called Dura is also the same name in Arabic. Dura is sometimes applied to maize, which is clearly a completely different ball game altogether. So when you start getting references in documents in Arabic, I can't read Arabic, I rely on other people to tell me this, uh, then you run into all sorts of nomenclatural problems. Who means what by what particular Arabic name? So I'm going to come back to this. If you're relying on the documents, it can be very, very tricky indeed. But you can see here uh, numerous samples of uh, yellow seeded uh, sorghum dura there coming through. The grains are free threshing. So if you start hammering a sorghum head like that, you will get clean seeds and uh, much easier to uh, actually deal with. Right, as I say, definitely after AD 59, well, after AD 1492, but bear in mind that we are occupied until about 1800 AD, the occasional maize cob is, I think, a lad. We have a few, that's all. Right, what is happening during the Nubian agricultural revolution? What starts to happen is the appearance of the sagia, right, the animal-powered water wheel. I don't know whether any of you are Western fans. I was watching The Good, The Bad, The Ugly the other night. The, uh, somebody, somebody is out there. When Lee Van Cleef makes his first appearance as the bad, he comes riding in out of the desert, and there's a little boy on a donkey riding around precisely like this, uh, operating a water wheel in Mexico somewhere, or Arizona, I don't know which. But, so, so if, if, if you want to see it in action, go there, because there are very few left. Uh, there are, I find this on the internet, I've never seen one in action. Uh, I would love to, uh, but there are sort of run-down specimens. The important point here is these canoe spots, the big pots that are tied onto the water wheel. To go back one, uh, you can see here that what you've got here is, is a, um, uh, a belt, if you like, with these pots on, so as the there he goes, uh, behind the thing um, there. As he goes round, this belt of pots goes down really quite deeply. It can go over a cliff into the Nile, or it can go into a dug well, or what have you. Uh, the pots then scoop the water up, come up the other side, full of water, and as they turn over the top, the water runs out into a trough and is taken away to irrigate a parcel of fields. So, as you can see, it is a much more efficient way of irrigating outside the normal Nile flood than is the old shadouf, which is just a bucket on an arm. So um, you can raise water far further because you can have a long belt with pots on and also you can raise a great deal more of it. So you can see the sort of scale of engineering that is required. We find canoe spots at Cassidy Green from about AD 100. That's a classic one. You can always spot them in the early days because they've got that knob on the bottom where you tie the rope on. This is our pottery specialist, Pam Rose. Um, and I got very excited about this, but she's been finding these, because these, these pots are reused as buckets, containers, any damn thing. Uh, so they're very, very common when they start coming in. She really couldn't work out why I got so excited when uh, this began coming through and I realized we had these things and that they actually coincided more or less with the start of the Nubian Agricultural Revolution. Giovanni Bellini Belzoni, the Swiss circus strongman and archaeologist, uh, the first European to see Abu Simbel in recent times. Uh, this is a drawing by him of the exploration of Abu Simbel. And incidentally, and much more useful for our purposes, you can see 
what the Soviet can do. Here we are at Low Nile, up by every symbol, and there's your Soviet going round and round. And here are the fields, parcel of fields that one Soviet can irrigate. There's another one over there, I think. So any area where the ground is relatively flat, it's not a huge area of land, but it does open up a completely different season of the agricultural year. And this really is what is happening with um, the sagia, the water wheel, and all these summer crops. It's a complete new season of agricultural utilization. And most of the crops that we see are the kinds of crops that can tolerate hot, dry summers, many of them are African. So sorghum is African, one or two of the other millets that I haven't shown you are African. The termis is probably not African. Uh, the origin of some of these is disputed, but certainly cotton is capable of growing in very, very hot, dry conditions, so long as there is a molecule of water, which of course the Sahaja can provide. So a whole new suite of crops to fit into this new summer regime. And actually, this is really rather neat. <clears throat> what we're seeing in the Pharaonic period is the original and genuine, thousands of years old, pre-pottery, Neolithic B winter package as originally domesticated in the Near East. And it gets into Egypt a bit later, and that is the winter package that fits into, very nicely, the Nile flood pattern because the Nile floods so that the crops can grow in the winter. The only way to have summer crops in Egypt is to irrigate. And interestingly, this actually has a parallel up to a point in India where the Rabi cultivation system is the old PPMB winter organization. And then the Kharif, the summer monsoon crops, of course the problem there is not too little water but too much water. So you've got to have hot, very wet tolerant plants. Uh, I can't remember what they are now in India. I was talking to our Indian specialist Derek Kennedy about this. Uh, uh, so it's a parallel up to a point in that both these areas are filling in what's otherwise a blank agricultural season in the year. Uh, and it's really quite nice because uh, if you read Bruce Trigger's book on Nubia and so on, uh, he says in that, that was written in the late 1960s, that so far as you can see, the population of Nubia uh, doubles or trebles in the early centuries AD, 2300 AD, which is when uh, the population starts for 3, 4, 500 AD, population in the rest of the ex Roman Empire starts to decrease. And he never knew why it was. And when I showed him this information uh, before he died, he was very, very keen. At last, he says, now we understand uh, they're doubling their agricultural productivity. He used the word doubling. I don't know whether they were doubling, but enhancing it, they certainly were. Right, <clears throat> we have radiocarbon dated uh, within the limits of our budget as many things as we possibly can to fit into the revolution. It doesn't all happen at once. On the left there, there are 25th dynasty dates from a variety of different plants, uh, all the kind of things that I've shown you uh, coming through uh, from traditional pharaonic and in terms of the, we're, we're not going to bother to date wheat and barley, we know they're there, or right, lentil, token lentil, some linseed, uh, all of that fits in, that's perfectly good. The ones that I'm arguing are part of the Nubian agricultural revolution are the ones in red. And you can see that we have a number of things, cotton, foxtail millet, the first durum wheat, and the first sorghum bicolor are coming through in the last century BC. Uh, various other things coming through. Bread wheat seems to come in a bit later. The turris, lab lab, sesame, these may be a little bit later. So it's not all happening at once so far as, and what we've done here is choose stratigraphically the earliest sample. I know this is not a pretty systematic way to go. If we had an awful lot more money, we'd have got 25 dates on sesame seeds alone, but we didn't have the cash to do it. So this is what we've got. And then subsequent things, uh, Dura sorghum coming through 1400-1500 AD, we have a few grains of rice, which presumably come in by sea from the Gulf or parts east. Uh, the cowpea, another African crop, but they are basically in radiocarbon date standard deviations is the Nubian agricultural revolution. Uh, I'll go back to that now. Okay, <clears throat> so the Nubian agricultural revolution is what tends to be called the Islamic 
Agricultural Revolution. Uh, Watson's book, Early Ag or what's it called, Agricultural Innovation in the Early Islamic World, uh, which is a, a very, very important book, argues that the Islamic Agricultural Revolution took place about 8900 and onwards. That is based almost entirely on textual records. Occasional bits of archaeology, not very many, but mostly textual records. And indeed, what Watson has picked up is a horizon of text records mentioning things like sorghum, cotton, various things like that. All the things, or some of the things, that go into the revolution. And I think this is a, these are largely the first documentary records of these things. I think, I'm going to suggest that this is one of those occasions when archaeology reaches the parts that other disciplines can't reach. History can't go there. Why is Watson seeing a horizon of these mentions around AD 1000? My suspicion is, and I need to follow this up, my suspicion is that this is when Arab gentlemen have translated Roman uh, writings of all kinds, and they're discovering that the Romans do sort of travelogues, gentlemen travel around the empire, record what they see, and the Arabs start thinking, well, we better do with that. Um, so they start writing about what they see. Now the Romans were doing that indeed, but the Romans have more or less, that shore of more or less dies by about AD 300. So there's the better part of a millennium where nobody much is writing about what's going on in agricultural fields. Right into that millennium falls the Nubian agricultural revolution. So I'm sure Watson is dead right in picking up these documentary records quite late, but that is just because nobody was writing about these things in the intervening time. So I think that's what Watson is capturing. What the archaeology is capturing is evidence that this Islamic agricultural revolution in Nubia is well pre-Islamic. What Islam does, I think, uh, is equally important, and that is spread it all over the Islamic world. So the technology, all the agricultural packages, they move all the way from Spain to India. I'm used to hear what Michelle has to think about say about this later on. But okay, all across the Islamic world, but from the core area of Nubia, where it was all already happening several centuries before Islam. Okay, I'm going to finish off over, well, I hope you're ready to go yet, so don't, don't breathe too soon, uh, with a consideration of sorghum. Because as I've said, uh, we have sorghum from about the birth of Christ or thereabouts. Sorghum is usually claimed to be a lot earlier than that elsewhere. So what is it doing as part of this revolution? Why don't we find it 700 BC in the 25th dynasty or before? Uh, one of the early people to look at this was Jack Harlan. He was the one who, uh, with uh, Johannes de Witt, evolved the sorghum typology that I mentioned earlier on. And Harlan, specifically on the basis of, he says, of, of no archaeological evidence, I suspect that by about 4000 BC, we have early sorghum cultivation across the Sahel, the eastern Sahel. That seems to fit. <coughs> So he and later people then uh, evolve a typology or, or, or a kind of historical version of this uh, with sorghum bicolor, like the black seeded early version taken to India uh, by around 2000 BC. There's a claim at Diamondback in India for early sorghum seeds. Uh, there is stuff of Benjadaro, uh, various sites. So in, in Harlan's world, Sorghum spreads Shongwei in Natal 2000 BC. Under there, right, is Dartichik in Mauritania 1000 BC. And then around um, the birth of Christ, Pliny, I put Pliny's name in the military right there, because Pliny has a mention of a new kind of millet arriving from the east in his lifetime. And Harlan believes that that is. Uh, Dura, the more advanced the yellow seeding form, coming back from India. So basically the primitive form of sorghum goes to India, the Indians cultivate it up and develop it into a new species or a new race of the plant, and then uh, back it goes and there's a relief at Nineveh from 700 BC showing Dura, and it gets back into Egypt that way. Okay, I've put a variety of these claims up there. 
Basically, none of these stands up to scrutiny. Adol Boost, which is what you can more or less say, so that's 2000 BC, and Canaro at 3000 BC, they have been re identified as wild sorghum. They're not domestic sorghum. But because the people who write these histories tend not to read all the detailed journals, they haven't sometimes caught up with the fact that these claims have been rejected and therefore carry on. Dartichik is another one. Um, to look at Dartichik properly, you have to go back to a French PhD from 1971, uh, written by a man called Jacques Felix, which I did. And here is a translation of his mention of sorghum at 1000 BC. Sorghum poses a delicate problem. I will admit its presence only with the greatest reservations. The only well-formed grain, one, that I have found is on a shed. It's an impression from Sayyid Winkwill, the Chub Cafes. And although it's true that it compares better with sorghum than with the other cereals studied, it is difficult to be affirmative in absence of the characteristic glues. The most one can say, if one does not wish to deny its existence altogether, is that the presence of this cereal is very incidental. Because in the copious winnowing debris, one should find some entire spikelets with their envelopes, just as one finds the bristles of involucres of Pedicita. So that is what that entire claim at 1000 BC is based on. Shongweni, down there in the Natal, right? Um, the grains have been directly dated subsequently, and they all date to after AD 1200. They are intrusive into those very early layers. Daimabad in India, very dodgy, only five grains were found under uncontrolled circumstances, and they have since been lost and are no longer available for study. So this very neat structure actually is resting on very little precise evidence whatsoever. Um, a major claim comes from Healy in the Oman, and there again is a translation from uh, Clusium, from Sir Constantini, in fact, who did the identification. There's his illustration. It's an impression in mud brick. Once again, it's an impression. It's not actually an archaeobotanical carbonized item. The sorghum impression lends, that's it, that's all there is, right? The sorghum impression lends itself less readily to a direct identification since the clay sedimentation sediment is sufficiently coarse and disturbed by various calcareous concretions and infiltrations of water. In addition, the rachis is twisted in several places and the spikelets are inevitably oriented towards the interior of the brick. We aren't given a photograph, we're given that drawing, which I suspect may flatter it somewhat. Uh, but that is all that we have from Healy. So this entire kind of pre-Christian era uh, pattern that people have tried to erect is really based on no single tangible find. One definitely identified archaeological seed published and illustrated and directly when carbon dated would prove this, but we don't have that yet. Right, 700 BC, here is Sorghum Dura coming back across Asia, having been ennobled in India into the Dura race, and the uh, Assyrians uh, stick on their temple walls, or whatever they do. There it is, that's it. Brilliant, I've told you that Sorghum is a very hot weather plant. It doesn't like much in the way of water. Here are people boating around stands of plain Sorghum. Just to prove it, here's some fish, right? These are weak boats. There's lots of this. This cannot be sorghum. What is it? I think it's Arundo Donax, the giant reed, uh, which has the same kind of um, bunched head. So if you go back, that could quite easily be depicted as that kind of thing. And these weeds, of course, are what make your weak boats. So I don't think these records are remotely reliable. We got all of dates from all the sites where we could get sorghum, and we got their earliest sorghum and ran radiocarbon dates in parallel with Cassidy Breen. You've seen these two here already on the date chart. Nothing else there is BC, except for, well, possibly 
the Merrimay is a very early date, but a very wide standard deviation. So these are the earliest directly dated sorghum finds anywhere. So it really could work. The late hypothesis that sorghum was first brought into cultivation on the Nile inside that red oval really could actually work. And I've put various other things on there. There's Pliny in the Mediterranean again, because Pliny, bless his heart, when you read him, mentions a black seeded millet. It's not the orange colored seeds of Dura, it's the black seeded variant, I think, of sorghum bicolor, the early version. Uh, so his mention in the first century AD fits perfectly with the horizon of radiocarbon dates, and his description does not agree with the yellow seeded sorghum Dura. I've put on some other finds there of uh, different dates where I think we are dealing with uh, real. Um, authenticated finds. Graham Collar's excavation at Daima, right? Um, it covers a couple of millennia, and he's got a horizon where sort of appears with a bang at about 8600. That's well dated, well established, big samples, well excavated, no trouble. Jenny Jano, first millennia of AD, and Dartichit, the site where Jacques Felix had that one very questionable impression, uh, late first millennium AD. So the horizon at the moment really could fit with sorghum first investigated in the Nile Valley and cascading out from there. As I say, one good find, right? One dated find, and I, I will eat my words, but at the moment, the pattern does stand up. And I just collect more and more and more first millennium BC sites without sorghum as they are gradually published. If sorghum is published much earlier, Right, there is Dima before AD 600, for example. If sorghum is cultivated earlier than 200 BC, if it goes back to 1000 or 2000 BC, where is it? It just has not yet turned up. Uh, I know that this is a minority view that most archaeobotanists, Mukund Kajane at Deccan College, think this is completely wrong. Um, Various people elsewhere think this is completely wrong. I just say, fine, all we need is the one good, definite identification, directly dated fine, and everything will be fine, and I will believe you. That will enable us to choose between these two hypotheses, the early and the late. For the time being, I still continue to claim that sorghum is part of the Nubian agricultural revolution, and is probably, I dare say, taken into cultivation somewhere on the middle of the Nile in the last few centuries BC. Okay, so I'm going to end there just by saying that I think, I reiterate, archaeobotany refreshes the parts that history cannot reach. When we do have historical mentions, they are doubtful. Uh, the Arab use of different terms for millets and sorghums and maize and stuff like that is highly variable. They weren't doing it for mechanical purposes. Why should they be very precise? If we over rely on them, we can be misled. We need to look very carefully at what people like Pliny actually say about the crops they're describing. And in particular, we really, really need more archaeological information. So until then, uh, these two hypotheses uh, about sorghum remain out there. But even if sorghum is not part of the agricultural revolution in the sense that it's cultivated somewhere else earlier, then its arrival in the middle of Nile at least fits neatly with the exploitation of the summer season. And I think to that extent, whatever happens, we can call it part of the new agricultural revolution. Okay, thank you very much. when they come to discussing their work and how it relates to other areas of work. I always have a thousand and one questions, so I would rather give anyone an opportunity if they have a question to ask. So do you have any content? Um, I mean, yes, we do, yes, yes. Uh, a lot of it. Um, the, the it appears at the same time, yes. Uh, but of course, it is cultivated uh, much, much earlier in different parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, originally in China, probably. Uh, so how that gets there, 
I don't know, but it does seem to appear in the same time frame. So there's a lot of, I don't suppose it relies on irrigation agriculture in the summer. It would fit perfectly well at any time of year, I think. Uh, but it does arrive in the right time frame. We have none in 700 BC. <laughs> All right, last one. Um, I know a little about cereals, it's not my field, but what's the difference in population terms for people between win that sweet of winter sown cereals and your summer sown cereals are sweet? Well, what about, what's the nutritional value and what's the yield? What does, it, what does it matter in terms of the populations you can support on those two different uh, The difference it makes is that you can use the same field twice in the same year. So uh, certainly the black seeded sorghum is good for making beer with, uh, the yellow seeded sorghum is not. I wonder if that's partly why you get less changeover uh, at the time when the Ottoman Congress takes place, more or less. Uh, so, so there are more things than just the kind of bread nutrition. But of course all the previous things, emerald wheat seems, I think, seems to dwindle away to little. But the other things we can carry on then. Uh, I think we're seeing a supplement, not a replacement, right? Pretty largely. So, uh, and, and, and I do buy Bruce Trigger's statement that this probably doubles yeah. the population in the area. Because, I mean, the summer would be a <coughs> huge time, especially after the big empires go, yeah. then uh, without so much movement and foodstuffs back, the summer is going to be the population limiter, I think. If you can liberate that, then you're talking about a considerable improvement. Yeah, could you just explain practically to me? I've got slightly difference between winter and summer cropping. Are you talking about winter sowing or winter harvesting? I'm talking about winter growing. Let me run back to yeah. the Go on, to There we go. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, the agricultural land is fully underwater and therefore useless from about July onwards. So you can sit there, you can look at your fields, but they'll be under a few feet of water. That's the time when the water is high and you can raise it still further onto previously uncultivated bits of ground. That's the idea. If we go forward again to the belt sodic, you can see it doing exactly that. Yes, that thing there. So here, here, here is the Nile, right, and with uh, water being raised, you can do this any time of year, depending on how high or low your sadia is. So you can either raise it above the maximum summer flood, or you can raise it uh, after the flood has gone away and you've taken your crop, you can raise water from the low Nile onto the previously cultivated fields in the summer. Sorghum is very quick growing. I think it's only about 80 days from planting to harvest. So it fits into a quite short, sharp, hot summer. Quite well. Uh, you've got to get out of the ground, of course. If, if it's on an area which you are then going to cultivate later, when the flood comes back, you've got to get it off before the flood starts to rise in July. Okay, so it's, it's the actual the implementation of the irrigation that encourages the, uh, the development of the crop, basically. That's the argument, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm interested in the um, water wheel technology. What analogues have you? got for that because I mean, it strikes me that they had similar sort of things in the Assyrian Empire and why does it get down or up the Nile as far as that? Why isn't it seen further down? Those are two very good questions that I don't have very good answers for. I don't know much about the Assyrian background of these things at all. Uh, I don't know how well dated outside the Nile the Sardia really is. Uh, my Egyptologist uh, colleagues tell me that they aren't aware of much previous to about, you know, 50 or 100 BC. But if anybody does know more about that, I'd be very grateful for any pointers towards publications. Okay, and on a lighter note, are you saying that uh, pasta was therefore invented here? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> certainly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, our, our agricultural evolution is quite a nice and kind of seductive idea because we can say that, oh, we know that there's a massive expansion of fertilization during this time, yeah. we can see the river <laughs> and therefore yes. plants make sense to be moving at that point. But if some of those plants you've got coming out in that early period, 
weren't in Nubia, they're not. So saw we you think maybe it's something that was kind of around the general area. I suspect so, yes. Much. But many of them come from other parts, like like Millet, for example. So what was going on at that point? Or at least converging this because that's what's kind of missing, is that kind of explanation, what was going on, why Nubia, what was going on. Good question. I, I don't know. It may be that, that <laughs> Things like millet are cultivated during the summer just because you have the technology, and traditionally you use the winter for your wheat, barley, ever wheat, barley, the standard PPNB and ferulic tradition. It may just be a traditional matter like that that people know what to do, and it's only when uh, Sarkia liberates uh, people from that kind of one season mindset that these things fit in. But, uh, but you're quite right, I mean, some of these things come in much earlier. Or, or are, are, are elsewhere much earlier, but they also seem to arrive in Nubia at the same time. And they wouldn't all necessarily be dependent on the irrigation agriculture. We don't know much about that period, does it? No. no. I was assuming not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, exciting. Right, am, I, am I right? The, this is basically um, linked to the Roman occupation of the. Or, just about that. Um, about that, uh, Roman and Beroitic, because the Roman okay, yeah, occupation is yeah. yeah. But uh, the, 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 I mean, basically, the, the Romans were very sophisticated when they used the water. Yeah, water yeah, yeah. But, I mean, there's a, I remember reading ages ago, there's a quote of some old guy who was travelling around the Roman Empire. He couldn't get to sleep because of the noise of the water wheels on, oh, right. on the river in the Zell or something. Gosh. He read this down. Uh, in the, in if you could let me have that quote, so I you, think great. if I remember correctly. Yeah, um, and it, it was very sophisticated. Um, I wondered whether how much you think that this is sort of a kind of almost a planned kind of um, agricultural development because there was problems elsewhere, maybe in North Africa, with um, you know I think because that was the bread basket and yeah. they're looking for alternative sources. It's quite possible. I mean, it does more or less fit with the final drying out of the Central Sahara. So exactly. it's entirely possible that the Romans are doing this deliberately yeah. and uh, are um, using this to replace some other in, in Algeria, for example, as it starts to go. But I've heard it argued that they came to, the early reason they came to bread was that we were quite good at growing cereals. Oh, yeah. Well, that's you know, like it's Martin Jones, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Martin Jones. That might be true. Um, and and I, I do recall um, in my early days, George Wilcox found a millet seed in London. What date? Roman. Right. There, there is Bronze Age millet in places like southern Scandinavia. Oh, that, okay. So millet has made it, right. yeah. but I, I'm not aware of any Iron Age finds. Okay. No, no, so, no, no, no. So Roman London would be, I mean, that would suggest. Not a kind of Bronze Age Baltic origin, but something else. Mm -hmm. So certainly, I mean, you know, other things, things like like cattle uh, get bigger under the Romans. So, they do, uh, yeah. So, so <laughs> they, as you know very well, yeah. so uh, they intensify uh, agriculture around the back. It wouldn't surprise me at all if this was a deliberate intensification effort. But I, I, you know, what I need, as you know, I mainly do the research and the delivery. I have this little sort of globule of knowledge hanging <laughs> on the middle dial here. Uh, and when I make this massive book, which I promise I'm going to do, I've got to broaden my kind of horizons to Spain to bring the whole world in my and this technology is coming from. But if you can find that quote, I don't know if you're angry, I think I'd be very good for that. Couldn't speak for the noise of water bits, something like that. Okay, then we should session and we can continue on at Harkins the part of the test and um, thank you all so much for coming and thank you to teacher for coming <laughs>